We actually came, found, about, found out about Chestertown looking for a boat. Uh, my husband came to Rock Hall, found a boat that we were looking for, and got all excited about Chestertown and told me about it and had to bring me here. And I realized it had everything I value. Um, walkable community, historic district, uh, it was going green as a community in terms of its commitment to that, a college town, um, near the water. All of the things that I get excited about um, were here. And so we made a pretty big decision, um, which was to essentially just pick up and move um, to this location. And we got married two months after we moved here. And so we really changed our lives to come here. Yeah, I, I love the story of Pittsburgh because, you know, it went through several renaissances, um, not only sort of cleaning up its air and water in the 50s, but then moving on to brownfield redevelopment in the 80s. and then. The renaissance that I got to be really a big part of was the whole green building movement and the sustainability movement. And um, I used to tell my students, you can go somewhere where it's been done, you can go somewhere where you can make a difference. And I think in Pittsburgh, I was fortunate to be somewhere where I felt like I was able to make a pretty big difference, not only in sustainability areas, but in community revitalization. Well, I think in the 80s, when, you know, jobs were being lost big time, you know, sites were being abandoned, Everybody was moving to the suburbs, you know, it really started in the 50s and then became pretty dire in the 80s where things started to really come, come back around again with brownfield redevelopment. Um, I think that there was definitely this sense that we're at a turning point where we are only going to have one shot at this and that's how we redefine our riverfronts, how we redefine ourselves as a city. Um, and so, you know, doing that in a way, first of all, with quality. Um, in terms of quality design and re rethinking reuse of existing sites um, and how do we sort of build for the long term and that's where the philanthropic uh, organizations come into play again because when you're dealing with governmental entities sometimes they can only think in four-year terms but when you're dealing with the, <laughs> with the foundations um, you know they're, they're in there for the long haul so they can invest in like design decisions. For instance, the design competition for the convention center was funded through the foundations. And so that was a long-term thinking and investment that really, I think, centered around quality design and long-term impact. Yeah, the role of universities is really multifaceted. I mean, you have to really start um, not only with, I think, because I used to teach, the importance of students. I mean, students are this amazing captive resource, not only in terms of putting them to work <laughs> to do research, you know, people who may be future residents and entrepreneurs in a community, so the more they are part of the community, the better in terms of the future in a number of ways. So I think it really starts with them. Um, absolutely the faculty, because the faculty has the opportunity to be, to live and work in a community and they can be a big partner in everything from, for instance, some of the design centers and things that we uh, had functioning in, in Pittsburgh. But then, of course, when you do get to the administration, you know, the leadership, the growth of the university, and having that really be planned and coordinating, coordinated with the surrounding communities, and to ensure that it was really positive growth, so university could grow in a way that was complementary to the surrounding community. And then, of course, the, the, the business and the research potential that comes out of universities as a business and economic engine for a region, there's that whole aspect of what I think the universities can do for a region. And so it's, it's really all across the board. And we were very fortunate because we have several universities in Pittsburgh that play a pretty important role in, in all levels. Yeah. The Main Street approach, which was really launched back in the 80s by the National Trust, is fundamentally a very strong approach to downtown revitalization, whether it be small town or large town. Um, in the four-point process, I totally believe in it's simple and it's basic, and that is organizational, you know, the full organizational structure, promotion, design, and economic restructuring. And if you really look at those four core pieces of it, um, who does it and how it comes about, I think, can vary. I, I really believe that there's something different between an association which really is really looking after specifically the, bis the interest of the existing business owners and how they work together in a true revitalization, redevelopment approach, which is oftentimes you do need professional help 
um, because you really need to look at things like economic restructuring, which is, I think, the biggest missing component that I see surficially, not having really studied it um, with Chestertown, is really understanding that economic restructuring aspect of the four-point approach. Um, what I've found, for instance, in the um, East Carson Street Main Street program that I worked with for several years, um, we had a lot of underutilized real estate on Main Street. So while it wasn't a vacancy, it was underutilized. We had a lot of businesses that weren't necessarily, they were just functioning. Um, and so really understanding who's, who are the consumers, who do you want to have consumers, what businesses are currently um, responding to that, and, who do, and who, do you, who do you, where are the gaps? Where are the businesses that you really need to fill some gaps where people have to go elsewhere um, to find those types of needs? And so the restructuring is, as the word says, it's really thinking about what you have now, what do you want to retain, what do you want to attract, and how do you help the businesses that are here now grow and become even stronger. Um, so it's a pretty comprehensive approach in and of itself. It can include everything from you know, business, um, we used to call it the Top Shops program, different types of business assistance type programs, um, everything as simple as storefront displays and merchandising. Um, but with real professional help associated with that, which is beyond, in a lot of cases, what a business association can do as a volunteer group, really looking at things like maybe uh, events and how to coordinate and how to help their specific business needs. I ran a community development corporation, and the community development corporation had the ability to act as professionals that had the development expertise to deal with whether it was business development support um, I did everything from business planning, you know, with, with my local merchants or people who wanted to move into the business district to, we had design review committees, um, we did housing development. You know, as a nonprofit 501c3 development corporation, we could actually have a fairly wide impact on the community, but then within that have Main Street programs and activity going on. Because if you think about it, Main Street can't succeed without people living here. To actually come and be customers and so you sort of need a dual program we built houses for instance we built over 100 houses in the time that I was in this was in a Pittsburgh location I would suspect that there's still demographic groups that um, that there still could be housing um, provided for in this location you know lower lower cost housing um, maybe better rental that's what we don't know and that's some of the data maybe someone knows I I, I don't know it um, and so I think the Community Development Corporation model is actually fairly good because then you get the professionals you need and you partner those with the volunteers who you still need um, to not only provide advisory support but also to be essentially your, your folks on the ground actually implementing also. Yeah, I think a small town, you know, particularly of this size, um, first of all, you know, does have to do fundraising. And to do fundraising, you need a, you need a solid plan and vision. There is no funder out there that will fund a program that doesn't have clear community consensus and support. A lot of partners behind that plan and vision, and they clearly can be confident that the money's going to be well invested. So that's fundamental. Um, and then, yeah, you do some fundraising, um, whether it be with private foundations, public funds. Um, I think partnerships are the other key thing, though. I think a town as small as Chestertown. Um, I've been really um, intrigued by the work that the East Restore Land Conservancy is doing with their Center for Small Towns. I mean, a group like that has, I think, a lot of potential. Um, and I think when you, when you can sort of join forces, maybe with a couple of other small towns that are facing some of the same issues and problems, maybe you share a Main Street manager or you share some of these types of professionals um, in some way and so that you are using resources efficiently and recognize the fact that this is a small town. Um, and what is the role of town government then? Uh, do they uh, basically defer to, I mean, the politics of it, I guess, mm -hmm. is... I'm in. Politics are always interesting. <laughs> they are elected officials, um, and they're there for a reason. And I think as elected officials, they have a couple of roles. One, leadership. I mean, I think first and foremost, elected officials are intended to be our leaders. They should be really looking toward the future um, of where the community needs to go. And they should also be, I think, helping to guide and direct and, and really develop what that future should look like uh, and then helping to implement that. Um, 
And so you have a combination of what I would call bold leadership that's willing to sort of get out there in front and really be visionary in a lot of ways. And then you have the more practical leadership that needs to really look at the practicality of prioritization and what can we fund and how should we face these types of things and what are the priorities for a community in budgeting and whatnot. Um, but I'd say it starts with leadership um, in, in helping to direct a vision and a, and a plan that's truly inclusive of the entire community, um, endorsing that in some manner, and then helping with the implementation of that, whether that be through resources or policy, um, but a variety of ways to really get behind it when, when it does come together to clearly be the plan of the community. Dr. So what does Chestertown want to be when it grows up? Um, the core question, and, and I think obviously that's a question for the community, but from my standpoint, you know, the, the opportunities I think present basically a few key things. One, I think the university being and the people who populate the university having an absolute direct connection. Um, and it's just seamless. Um, that it's not sitting up on the hill, that there's a seamless interconnection. And I think with the waterfront redevelopment of the Armory site, that becomes the bookend. And there becomes an opportunity to really start bringing um, a lot of that university population actually through the town and not just sitting up remote from the town. And that means a lot of things. It means um, nightlife in a positive way in that, you know, that there's actually students, um, you know, and university faculty and, and places open at night, whether it be the Thai restaurant um, or the coffee shops, but places for people to go in the evening or after rowing practice in the morning or, or in the evening or sailing regattas. That's just continual, not just moments that happen on an occasional weekend now and then, that it's ongoing. So I think that's core. Um, I think growing the job base, and I would say growing that job base is going to depend a lot on the economic base that's really going to allow people to be here and live here um, because they have a job here and they're not just commuting in on the weekends. And that's going to depend a lot on, I think, um, entrepreneurialism. I think we live in an age now where it isn't necessarily what's the next big manufacturer that's going to open here but it's who's the next entrepreneur that's going to see a regional asset here, whether that be um, new kayaks that get built here because this is the perfect place to be able to test those kayaks, um, you know, or, or bicycle, um, you know, making use of some of those local assets we have, like these natural resources, and maybe turning those into entrepreneurial opportunities because this is the place people want to be to use those types of things. And those are just a couple of examples, but you can take that into into these areas that I think we're known for, the arts, the history, and there's entrepreneurial opportunities that come out of all of that, and people can live here, and it might be just five to ten person jobs, but those add up to a lot for a community of this size. So I would like to see a whole lot more and that economic base that really leverages some of these core assets of the community.